uh, I changed a little bit uh, my title, and you will, but the, the main idea of the paper is the same. What I intended when uh, David asked me to, to give a talk here. Uh, on this, uh, uh, just to, to introduce your talk, you see, uh, I took these pictures from uh, this drawing uh, from um, a science article, so this uh, big uh, US uh, journal, scientific journal, uh, it from the 1970s, and it was at a time where there were uh, lots of controversies around the pesticides called DTT, and it was in process of being banned. But people were already, it was a, quite a famous pesticide, an insecticide, developed during the Second World War, and there were lots and wo a worldwide uh, controversies around it and around uh, its, um, its health effect, and its especially its carcinogenic genetic health effects. So uh, what you see here is the people who are uh, uh, checking a computer, so, so the computers of the time, and what, what they were saying, well, okay, we don't like the answers, let's give it a security check, so change the program so that it gives the right answers. So it's a bit of, and what they were, they were illustrating is that when you don't like the answers of the toxicology test and all the risk assessments which are being made on the DTT, well, you were, uh, you were changing, you had to change, and you are trying to change the way the toxicological assessments of the pesticides were done within the regulatory and the governmental uh, agencies or within the industries. So this is a bit of the idea, one of the idea of this, uh, this, station, this talk, of these papers, is how um, basically uh, industries or economic uh, interests are or, and have been uh, or were embedded into the infra-regulatory tools, scientific-based tools, which have been designed so to basically uh, um, assess and uh, evaluate the toxicity and uh, to build on uh, then regulatory uh, standards for toxic substances. substances. And what I will do is, by over argument in this, uh, in this talk, is also that you need to learn on the to look at on, on the long term. What is not, this is not on a one-time basis, but this, this uh, process is built on the long run, in the long run, and is uh, constantly renewed and uh, maintained by a social, what I call social works done by industries and all their allies. So, just uh, in the paper I gave, uh, I j just wanted to, to put into perspective uh, this talk. Uh, this is part of, um, it, uh, it, uh, it is part of, um, of uh, work groups. So we were a group of scholars uh, with colleagues. We tried, we have been trying for a few, for a few years now to try to uh, reflect on the pervasive powers basically uh, of, of, the, of what we call the pervasive powers of the corporate authorities. I will come back to that. But how big corporations and their allies, so maybe for instance we can think of uh, uh, lots of uh, uh, like Bildex, the foundation, the philanthropic foundation like Bill Gates, this is the kind of allies they can find. So this could be peer, uh, companies specialized for uh, these corporate actors. They are acting, no, uh, and they have been acting not simply into, like, let's say, parliamentary arena, governmental arena, like uh, ministry cabinets, but at many, many other levels and in many other spaces. This is this idea of pervasiveness. And now they are acting in, uh, in areas where no um, let's say a representative from the citizen may be involved or no governmental actors may be involved. Like for instance, a business board and that in these places decision can be made which affect not only the companies but many other areas. Like, uh, and uh, that decisions which will affect the whole economic sectors with job losses for instance. And this is what uh, somebody like uh, uh, 
like a uh, paper, cool paper call, uh, called The Quiet Politics. The, pa the politics which are not accessible to uh, the representative, uh, uh, the, 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 the public representations. Uh, our ideas, and there is one publication which was just out, out it's that we do need, you need to go into numer a, a great variety of social places and to look at a wide range of strategies, not some of them, and you need to look to understand this corporate power, or these corporate powers, into, uh, into spaces where you don't, uh, which are very uh, quiet, which are, which are uh, discreet, very discreet, and what I will do today, into spaces which has at a very uh, infra -labor, uh, infra regulatory level, and which have a strong private dimensions. Uh, what we do, uh, this is, I already uh, introduced it, but we, look, we want to, to, to look at this uh, social work uh, as renewed, at the multi uh, uh, face, fa uh, faced it, we call it, at, uh, of, uh, uh, of these corporate actors. We want uh, to look also uh, in the normal, usual practice of a corporate actors, not uh, as something, as some things which would be extraordinary to solve crises, for instance. And uh, we, what we want also, and what I will do today, is also to look at how uh, uh, public actors uh, and uh, spaces and institutions and instruments are actively co-constructed. This is we run against the idea that you have a, a public administration, for instance, which would be separated from uh, all the interest in the societies, but they are really co-constructed, and uh, in including by dominant economic actors, and they can they can be co-constructed also at the very infra le uh, infra uh, regulatory level. As far as I am concern, concerned, I have uh, suggested to, uh, suggested, suggested to uh, this notion of corporate systemic ascendancy. So, ascendancy, it's, um, uh, it's a translation of a word, of a French word, which is called, which is emprise, but this word has no exact translation into English. Uh, the uh, emprise uh, word uh, is, uh, is, uh, is the idea we can be translated by, by old grip power. So you have many, many different types of translation, but it doesn't quite exactly fit uh, the idea of emprise. Emprise, uh, it is a, a word to, uh, to, uh, to, to express the idea that somebody will gain power progressively over somebody else. But it has also, uh, this is the basic idea, but it, uh, you can find this idea in many, uh, in, it's also a technical idea uh, in many different types of uh, arena, in geography, for instance, for when an in economic activities uh, spread over a territory, it transforms this territory and it gets an apprise on this territory, for instance. It is also a word which is used uh, into um, psychology, uh, in t uh, so to, uh, to, to express uh, uh, a hold from somebody to another person which is really destructive. So this is this main, uh, this main idea. It is used uh, also uh, in social sciences but it is really uh, defined. And the, maybe the, there is a French author, which uh, social scientist was uh, was also tried to define it, and he used he is using the idea of uh, these uh, images of uh, um, uh, uh, sorry a web a spider web, which is uh, progressively the idea is uh, that it is uh, first you don't see it. It's, you say, and one, uh, one, uh, one bit by after, after another bit, it is building something. It means that it can be destroyed at some point, but if, when it is there, you only grasp it when it is there, and you, when your, your moves are so constrained that you're trapped. 
And the idea of, uh, in this idea of, uh, of a web, in this idea of, uh, so this is, uh, this is to it, and I think it quite expressed both the idea that you need time, so you need time, it's not like this at once, that it is systemic, that if you want some efficiency, you need to go and to transform uh, all the space you have and to build a, a web uh, on all the space you need to have. And this is the idea that you need a substantial so, uh, social, uh, social work. And the last idea, maybe, it's the transformative character that uh, happened when there is a deployment of this corporate systemic ascendancy. It transforms the, pe the people, the process, the, the society in which it deploys. And maybe the last idea uh, of emprise, it, it may have strong negative effects. And uh, in, uh, in English also, I think that the pervasive idea is also sometimes associated with this idea of transformations and which may have negative effects. So, uh, I, uh, <coughs> in, the book I, uh, in the book we, uh, we co-edited, I wrote a paper on the, pesti on, the, on, the ne on the emergence of the French pesticide industries and how it deployed uh, such uh, corporate systemic ascendancies in France. But what uh, I will do now is to go into another places. Uh, and uh, this, uh, this other places is very different. It's instead of uh, looking at, dif at uh, different social spaces, here I will go into one social spaces, which is uh, 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 an expert committee, two expert committees, uh, which were created just after the Second World War in the, uh, in the 50s, and which were dealing with food additive and food contaminants. Uh, so, uh, what are these? Uh, these were the two. Uh, there were a lot of places at the time, of a lot, uh, a lot of institution, uh, organization, private and public, were uh, at the time setting uh, committees to deal with uh, these issues. Expert committees. Uh, it was a very, um, uh, it was a, a strong question because it was, li it was linked with the development of international markets for food and uh, for food stuff, for agricultural products. And at that time, uh, we were just after the Second World War, when the economy needed to be reconstructed and one of the first things we wanted to reconstruct was agriculture and the food industries. And what uh, Every nation and at an international level, what wanted to be done is to construct global market, international and global market for food. And one thing which was important uh, was the idea that uh, health standards, health protection standards, health safety standards could act as a distinguished uh, trade barrier. And so there were lots of actions they were on to standardize food, including food additive and contaminants, to avoid uh, this idea uh, to these trade barriers. Uh, so the, the, two, the two United Nations, the United Nations were, uh, this is, were just created, and uh, there were two United Nations organizations, the World Health Organization and the Food and Agriculture Organizations. They, uh, they joined into a private endeavor. It was, not, it was a private system, it was not considered as a public system, to create their own committee expert committees and there was uh, war, uh, so the joint expert committee on food additive and the other important was the joint meeting on pesticide residues and these committees they, they had a consultative but a very important role because they became a kind of reference for other committees in other organizations including no, notably the European European Economic uh, Community when uh, they set up such committees uh, from the, the turn of the 50s or the 60s, but for other places as well. Like uh, in France, we, uh, the, 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 com the national committees or in Germany, they were referring to it. They, they, they might not take the same decision, but they were referring, it was a kind of reference. So it was quite important. 
And uh, the other thing is that at, uh, from the mid 60s, it become, uh, they, it, uh, they become, uh, they, have, uh, beca uh, they became the, this uh, the Joint Expert Committee on Food Additive became the official committee uh, of uh, Codex Alimentarius, which was also a private uh, system, standard system, which was set up by uh, the, the World Health Organization and the Food and Agriculture Organization. And the Codex Alimentarius is quite important now. It's, uh, it's uh, really uh, an important actor within the global food trade. And especially it relates to the SPS uh, agreement, which is a, a strong agreement for all the, all the, uh, the, um, uh, the food stuff uh, trade worldwide. So each time there is a controversies uh, between uh, two uh, between two countries. For instance, there are there there were controversies around GMOs between Europe and uh, the US, and uh, it was uh, it it was uh, dealt with by uh, within the SPS agreement and the expert committees for dealing with the, uh, with uh, the claim uh, the scientific claim that uh, GMOs could be used or should not be used uh, was the joint expert committee on food additive so it's really it has become this official uh, this official expert within the food dispute at international levels uh, so it's quite on the long run. It's quite important to uh, to, to uh, it was a, it is a quite important uh, and uh, the joint meeting of pesticide is the same. It's quite uh, important committees. So what I would like to show is f it's that from the very beginning, it has never been thought uh, of as an independent committee that we would uh, really thought of. It has been. Uh, thought of as a co-constructed committees with industries and not with citizens, even if at the time it, it has not, uh, no, no, it was not the sense where we are not different, but and it, it has been uh, thought of as a, a places to, to try to, to dealt together with, uh, to dealt together with issues of safety and trade. And not exact. So it's quite. A, it's an important thing. I, that with this idea, uh, this, uh, and this is a way also with uh, to to deal with what we find in the literature very often that there is a, an institutional attenuation of risk, that the institutions, whether private or public, are dealing with risk issues. They tend to downplay them when you look at pricelessly, uh, even when there are. Uh, Pre, uh, precautionary claim, for instance, and so it's a way also to to understand and uh, what is behind uh, this process of institutional attenuations of risk. So, what I will look uh, I will look at different things, uh, different uh, form of actions which uh, operate within these committees. And uh, you can do that with many other committees or express, uh, uh, expert evaluation of risk of or hazards uh, for chemicals, which is what I know more, but other type of risk where there is a strong uh, economic interest involved. The first thing is a question of worldview, what I'll call worldview. What are the worldviews of the institutions setting up the, committee, the committees and within the committees, which are deployed and what you can see, which permeate, which are embedded in the committees? The second will be something which is usually done. You look at the profile of the experts. So this is uh, when NGOs, and they are right to do that, uh, or even social scientists, they try to, to see what, uh, whom this, uh, the expert work for, who they, are, they were working for before or, or after. We called it revolving doors, and if they, if they circulate between private and public spaces, etc., the kind of interest and the kind of network we are caught in. We can do that, and this is important to do that, but I think it's not enough. Uh, we lo also need to look uh, at what I called, and it's not uh, only me, it's, I took it with these expressions from uh, the people from the FAO and the World F WHO. This is the machinery of uh, expertise. 
how this expertise, the expert work is carried out and produced, it seems to me it's quite important to look at. And in the detail of the, of the process, you can see also how the industry can be, uh, industries can be evolved. And the, at the end, uh, we also need to look at what comes out and uh, what is produced and the characteristic of what is produced out of these committees. Uh, this is uh, four points we can look at. So, what were the world views first? And uh, this is quite uh, this is really quite striking when you look, probably because uh, uh, so maybe the documentation uh, the documents uh, so I just to to, to uh, I worked on the public report of these committees which you can download, uh, on, for instance, on the World Health Organization websites, but um, also worked on the archives of these committees, which I were left. So, uh, and uh, not only of these committees, I went uh, to archives also uh, of other committees which were related to this one and dealing with the same issues, uh, and which in the uh, United States and also in, in the EEC, uh, so the European Economic Committee uh, uh, Communities archives. So, and. Uh, Mostly everywhere, you all, always have this, uh, the strong idea that you need, you need uh, to, to take into account, uh, into account the, uh, the, 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 the economic, the industry and the economic uh, aspect of uh, the question of food additive and contaminants. Uh, the food additive and contaminant issue is an old issue, uh, which is oh, as old as the food industry and uh, industry exists, and uh, the uh, and is probably from the, the end of the 19th century. But uh, in the 50s and 60s, there is an explosion and the big trans and the rapid uh, transformation of these industries and in food processing. Uh, and uh, this is linked to the, uh, the wide availability the student wide availability of a great number of, uh, of food additives. And uh, so, for instance, already in 1954, uh, 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 you had around 20 different food additive categories. So, Emil Safer, food coloring, for instance, uh, uh, so many different uh, categories. And uh, sometimes you had uh, hundreds of additives. Uh, in each category, so it's uh, quite a lot of number, and some of about diff uh, 70 different food contaminants. For instance, pesticides, antibiotic residues, hormone residues that could be used to grow uh, cattle, etc., etc. So you had many of them plastics already, uh, at least in the U.S., so which were which could be found in a, into food uh, uh, into food stuff. And the idea, the question is, is that dangerous for the people who are eating the food? And how should we regulate uh, the, uh, the input of this, uh, this direct or indirect input of uh, additive into the, into, uh, into the food? And the big question was the one of carcinogen. Why? Uh, the substances which could be carcinogenic. Why? Because this was a period of time where some scientists, and especially it came from Germany, were uh, producing, uh, uh, producing so models and evidence that there can't be any uh, safe level of carcinogenic uh, carcinogen. If you expose even with, uh, to the uh, lowest doses of carcinogen, you might get a cancer. You not necessarily would get a cancer, but you might get a cancer and you can't, we can't, uh, it's not, that the idea of the scientists is it, was, it is not absolutely not possible to guarantee a safe exposure to carcinogen. So if you were ingesting some carcinogen, even the tiniest, the lowest dose, you might get a cancer. This was the idea behind, uh, uh, behind all of these agitation, uh, agitations and uh, debate, and there were a lot around uh, foodstuff. What happened in these committees, the, the two I am talking to uh, today, but uh, the others at the same time, 
they were dealing, uh, trying to develop lots of uh, what uh, I call regulatory tools, or tools which would eventually enter the regulation or help to be build private and public regulations. And uh, most of the time they are intricated. Private and public regulation are not separated. They, they are intricated and they work together. Uh, this is what we call co-regulation. And uh, they were of, we all often, uh, we very often talk about uh, protocols and the protocols to establish the toxicity of the substances. So there are protocols. Uh, certain tests are chosen and, not, and others are set apart. So there are official protocols. They were pro producing also classification. This is an important tool for the regulations and uh, by type of toxicity, type of use, origins, and there are lots of classifications which were produced, including some called positive and negative lists. Positive is the idea, this list of chemicals is allowed into food, this one is not allowed at all, and it has not uh, the same uh, rationale behind. Limit values, this is the idea, we allow this chemical but up to that level, and uh, above this level it's forbidden. Specifications, this is all the methodology, um, the official method of analyze, uh, of, uh, to analyze the chemical composition and the physical compositions of, of the product, of the, uh, the food additive and contaminant. It's quite important because not all the methods have the same sensibilities. And so uh, are able to, de to be as precise to detect quantities or et cetera, et cetera. And you can do a lot by, this, uh, by choosing different type of method, methods. And uh, what I will present, the machinery of expertise and all the machineries of regulation. So uh, what end up to an actual regulation. So the world views. I put here two, uh, two extracts. Uh, so the, this, uh, the, the first co committees on food additive were, was launched by a big conference in, the, in, 50, uh, in 54 by the World Health Organization and uh, the FAO. And uh, they were uh, in this, uh, in the, uh, they, were a they were, I think, I think uh, 12 or 13 countries representative. Represented, represented into sorry, uh, this, uh, this big conference and there was a series of uh, trade and industry uh, organizations which were also present uh, uh, at this, uh, at this uh, conference. There were another one uh, into, uh, in 64, uh, 62 also to launch and to uh, launch uh, the, the, the Codex Alimentarius and there there were many more countries presented and many more or, uh, industry organizations pre which were present as well. So uh, the, it's not uh, uh, meetings, uh, these, the, these were the two big meetings, but even the, uh, and we, it's not only a presence which were there. Uh, in all the texts related to this big conference and uh, the texts we can find and the documents we can find uh, related to each individual uh, meetings of the committees, we have uh, this, uh, this idea that uh, the food additive is, uh, uh, apart from alpha effects, the subject of food additive is one which affects international trade. And this is the key issue. The greater the measure of agreement on, on method of testing, on the interpretation of the results, interpretation of the results, this is also something important, on ultimately on the actual list of permitted uh, food additive, the greater the advantage to the free movement of manufactured foods in international trade. And this is really the core idea behind these expert committees. The expert committees are not set up to, well, in a way, we define what is uh, safe and not safe, and then uh, when we do, uh, we, we suggest, uh, when then uh, we will, so the decision will be based upon that. We have to integrate also this dimension. Yeah, I see that. So, the experts. Uh, when we look at the experts, uh, 
you see it, uh, we have a list here from, for instance, one committees. Uh, we have three categories. And I think it's important, you have members, which are supposed to be scientists and specialists of the issues which will be dealt in the committees. You have uh, observers, they are su not supposed to, uh, to write to intervene, but still they are present. And you have a secretariat. Secretariat is quite important, uh, as they were the ones who were drafting the reports and preparing them. And if you looked, you can see that you have uh, people who are represent, uh, mem uh, working for industries quite directly. So uh, you, can see, uh, you can see them. And you have people who seem to work for, uh, for universities. But if you looked at their profile, for instance, uh, Professor Alistair Fraser, uh, is, uh, is working at head of uh, uh, in a uh, New York City department, but in fact is somebody who is uh, really working for the industries, whose institute is funded by the food industries, etc. Uh, you have another profile, like uh, Professor uh, uh, René Truau, who is somebody with, uh, who is uh, quite uh, quite important uh, in this, uh, which who is French, uh, was French, and uh, uh, in this uh, all ecosy world ecosystem, and he is not working uh, like his laboratory is not directly funded by the industry, but he has lots of link with the industries, uh, and the, not only the food industries actually. What is important as well is that you can see uh, Professor Tru also acted as an observer for uh, the International Union. So they are multi-positioned, these people. They go to other committees and other uh, uh, also uh, uh, organization. And uh, according to the meeting, uh, the list change of the people according to the meeting. It's, it's not the same list at, uh, all the time, but uh, they can change, uh, they can, at, at some, sometimes they can be in the secretariat, sometimes they can be observers, sometimes they can be president, etc., etc. And they are also doing the same, for instance, in the EEC committee, in, the EC, uh, in committees of the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry, which was an important uh, actor for the production of specifications, etc., etc. So well, this is uh, it built. We can uh, map this, and it uh, create a kind of uh, what we call invisible college. College. So David de Morton really ex uh, developed this idea in his work. There are other people, but for this type of expert, more recently, but already it was there was a kind of networks of people, and uh, they were not that number at that time. So they, they all need, uh, uh, knew each other. And it's quite important uh, to, to that because this regular meeting of the same people in different places talking about the same thing, they together build certain ways of thinking. And as actors with uh, industrial ties were present, they, it also helps to uh, gradually, bit by bit, IPCs put into place elements technical elements, scientific and technical elements, which uh, were embedding and uh, incorporating uh, the, the, ways the, industry, uh, the ways the industries wanted the food additive to be assessed and contaminant. So this, this was René Truau, but you can see uh, there uh, this uh, bit, little bit. Let's go to the machinery of, uh, uh, of expertise. Uh, so this was the work of uh, this, uh, these people there, the, what the so-called scientists working for the, food, uh, the World Health Organization and working uh, for the Food and Agriculture Organization. These people had the food technologists or scientists. They were, they, this was their title the official title, and they were, they were there working for these two industries. And sometimes their career, they could go on into national, like uh, the US or the Canadian uh, uh, regulatory bodies, administration, but also to the industries or to make a career in, into these uh, this, uh, two uh, international organizations or other organizations. 
So what their, their work was quite complex because they had to manage all the hierarchical relationships, and they were a lot. The relationship within the two organizations, which sometimes didn't have the same interest. They have to choose the experts, and it was quite a complex com process. They had to set the agenda of the meetings and to produce, to organize the production of the technical reports. Basically, uh, they were the, to choose the expert, they were a two-step two process. First, uh, as they were in the United Nations organizations, they, had to, they, they would set up a list of experts which they could pick up from, for each committee. And uh, so the, you were appointed for five years, but you may, you may not have been called during the five years. But the idea is that every IRS was represented and you needed the approval of the, uh, the, the government of the state to be put into this list. So it was a, a quite a negotiation. At the same time, uh, uh, so then you needed to, when you were, you were, pro, you, you were planning the meeti a meeting and a committee, you needed to, to choose the expert for this precise meeting. And then there were lots of discussions for which suitable candidate could be, uh, could be uh, choose from. So the argument, uh, the, the reason you would choose a candidate was uh, its, uh, its competency, its skills, what he was specialist, had specialized art. There were all these uh, reasons, but it was also uh, kind of um, if you were uh, used to work with him or her sometimes, uh, and uh, what you can expect from him. So, and it was quite, uh, and you needed also which countries, sometimes it uh, for the list it happens, it was important. But when you precisely looked at, uh, even if uh, the list, uh, the expert uh, change, uh, which were uh, called, were changed from uh, one committee to another, which is not, they were not there for five, or for five years, for instance, the, there are names which come again and again and again. And they, were, they, they ensure the continuity of uh, probably of a knowledge, but they also, it means that with these people, you have uh, the, the FAO and uh, the World Health Scientist that bring a special relationship. And, uh, and it, this is also the people you usually find in other committees, in the EEC, in the US, etc., and in other international organizations. They are the kind of pillar of these works. The other things you need to do is to set up the agenda. What will be the theme of the next meeting? And this is, and there you have letters where you see all the process of these negotiations for producing the agenda. And what is interesting in this letter is that these people talk to the industries before setting the agenda. And that in these letters, which I put in the paper, uh, what the, uh, this, uh, the sci this scientist uh, from uh, the, the, this is a, a letter from a scientist from the World Health Organization wo writing to a scienti the scientist from the FAO, the, for the Food and Agriculture Organizations, and what he's saying, yes, oh, okay, we need to fix the, the agenda of this next meeting. I thought we could, uh, we could work on uh, the, the um, f on uh, food colors, but it's not uh, on the specification for food colors. But in fact, I talked to the uh, to IG Farben, and uh, they are not ready. I took to IEC, which is Imperial Chemical Industries in uh, in the UK, the big uh, the big uh, the biggest corporate uh, comp com uh, company, a uh, British company, uh, chemical companies. And okay, they are not really ready. I took to Switzerland. So let's find basically another theme. You said to me basically that uh, you were, uh, people, some people were interested in how we could uh, assess carcinogens. I was not really agree, but now I think it's a good idea. I talked to other people, etc., etc. So this, this was a complex process which involved industries and what they were they are ready to talk to about, they were their own, uh, their own specifications and methodology were ready or not, etc., etc. And as you see, we were, they were still a national big company, so it was quite complicated to have uh, all of them uh, agreed 
uh, on, the, on, the, so on the agenda, on the time, etc., and even more on the methods. So this is, and then you, when you've decided that you want to, to you want uh, the next bit will be about uh, carcinogenity, you will need to, uh, you will need uh, to, to have a detailed agenda about what will be uh, talked to, uh, so I know there is five minutes. <laughs> So, let's see. So once you set up the meeting, the agenda, you have prepared it with all the, the uh, person which need to, to be involved, this, this is not the end of, uh, of the work. There are all, all many other things to, uh, to manage. And they were, uh, the World Health Organization and the FAO and many other committees which were which could partly have the same theme, like uh, their, their jurisdictions may overlap a bit. And uh, either you need did the work uh, uh, they've done to do your own work in your own committee, or they may be fight. Is that our responsibility, you use, etc., cetera, et cetera. Uh, there were also uh, lots of discussion when the Codex Alimentarius was, uh, set, uh, was set up from that time on. Uh, they, they, they needed lots of coordination work needed to be done with uh, the Codex Alimentarius. And uh, this was uh, quite co complex and it also changed uh, from the second part of the 60s and in the 70s the work performed uh, within these committees. So they were over, all over, uh, over issues and one important issue is because it's still there today 50, 70 years uh, after these committees were set up, is the, sca the scarcity of data and the relations of the data and information provided by the industries. And uh, when you work with expert committee, I did that myself as an expert, it's always the same issue. We don't have enough data to, go to come to a conclusions. And uh, you, you, somebody like uh, called Henri Boulier, a French guy, he wrote a book and he wrote a paper, it's in French, but if you read French, look, look at it, is how to evaluate, um, to evaluate empty files, empty uh, submissions, because they, the industry submits uh, files and applications with no data, not enough data, and you still have to make uh, decisions and you still to have to evaluate them. And what happened is then that you only evaluate the economic side of the problems and not the toxicological side of a problem. And it's a long, it has a long history and it has not been solved 70 years afterwards. And the other problem is that uh, there were, I, I told you, very substance which, substances, which, substances which were dealt with in fact, and most of the subventions, they were authorized without almost any kind of evaluations in many ways, or many residues were there, for the product they were authorized, but without the, the present, the, if the, toxic, the residues which would be present in food would be toxic or not, uh, some health effects. And the, the only and it was only substances which attracted attention. And when they attracted attention in one committee, then over the other committees would also work on the same substances because the people circulated and it created a kind of effect uh, like this. We, we work here, this is a question here, okay, we have to deal with it. We also, uh, in the EEC, we have also to deal with these substances, etc., etc. So they were a kind of, there was a kind of, they are, they, they have, and it's still the case, when, the, for instance, BPA became an issue in the United States, tenure became a, an issue in the EU and the world were the issues, and then all, uh, lots of resources which put only in the BPA, for instance, uh, and uh, it means that uh, the other substances were not dealt with, for instance. So, uh, it has the ki this, uh, this kind of effect. There are few resources and then they are put only in a limited amount of substances. So just to give you an example of that, this is extract from one uh, on specification and you have all the, uh, the things which you can find uh, in this report, which also mean that uh, it, the, the power of these industries were not uh, 
they were resistant to it. Uh, and uh, there were also some professional practices and from professional views of what should be done from these people in the committees or in the FAO on World Health Organization, which not always would match what uh, the industries were, were trying to, 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 to put into place. And you see, we, we, we can see in this report and the archive some kinds uh, some kind of conflicts and the kind of boundaries which were being trained to be pushed in a way or another. And so it constructs what's, uh, what's called uh, now, what we call now on the, on the time, or what they call now the regulator, reg how to produce regulatory knowledge, and some people are calling, calling regulatory science as well. I won't discuss that. So, um, if you go to Germany, uh, in Hamburg, you can visit, uh, there is a museum uh, with, uh, uh, there with uh, this is a pride and museum from the food industries and uh, we, this, uh, you will see an uh, example uh, of uh, tens of thousands of uh, food additives and uh, of course you don't have uh, food contaminants uh, uh, in the list, but it's quite interesting. So just to try to think about the the varieties of substances you, you can find in industrial foods and how uh, industrial foods are uh, built actually with uh, uh, mi mixtures of, uh, of chemicals. Uh, and so uh, if you want to understand uh, you want to understand the, uh, the, the power industries can have over um, over, uh, over the regulations of food additive or food contaminants of the production of food stuff at a larger scale, uh, you, you can't understand it only at uh, looking at how big regulations are produced or big, uh, and how uh, what's happened uh, really, uh, I don't know, in the parliament, for instance, of the ministry cabinets. You really ne need to look into these places, and there are many other places, and even in places where the method of analyze are chosen. Actually, it's uh, in, for Europe, it's in the OECD committees and they are really closed. I mean, nobody, industries can enter them, but even uh, experts from the national uh, food safety agencies of the, uh, have difficulties to enter there for different reasons. So, and this is in the very precise methods uh, you choose to analyze, uh, to, to define what a nanomaterial is, or for instance, what uh, uh, dioxin titanite the regulatory definition of dioxin uh, because it's, it has been just banned in uh, October. Uh, titan dioxide has been banned, uh, in, uh, was banned in October in foodstuff in Europe. But you need also to look at what is the regulatory definitions of dioxide uh, titan, sorry, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. If you want to understand really what the regulation is, not simply that it has been banned. So this is basically the take home message here. Uh, and this is this idea of pervasiveness and how it is difficult also to circumscribe, to, to, to grasp, uh, our corporate, uh, big corporation, or co the co what we corporate can uh, corporate corporations so or big industries can uh, transform the world we are in. It's because it's not only where uh, public decisions are, are made. Uh, and don't forget that all the, the, all of the last thing uh, I told it, uh, I told, uh, explained it in the in the beginning, is that uh, all of this thing, all this, this GFK, the Codex, uh, Codex Alimentarius, which are really important, are private regulation to which states adhere too. So I'm done. So thank you for your attention. Uh, so hello everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Natalie Jass for this amazing presentation. I think we all gained a lot of, um, like, uh, we got acquainted with the forms of how corporate, uh, how industries can affect oh, louder. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> how uh, how industries uh, can have uh, effect on the production and implementation. 
and we have gained the insight on the depth and the limits of um, the forms of that influence, of the uh, influence of corporations on public policy, uh, that in the paper uh, we call, uh, you call, uh, uh, corporate systemic ascendancy. And uh, as you already mentioned, this uh, concept uh, comes from um, the idea of uh, emprise, if I'm uh, saying it correctly in French, uh, and it is a word that uh, doesn't have a translation in English, and that's why I decided to, uh, for the sake of understanding, to translate it to some of your native languages, maybe uh, it will bring you some clearance, uh, and I don't know if the word that Google Translate gave me as a translation of that uh, has the same depth, but uh, with Empress, uh, we have uh, uh, everyday meaning of it. We have the meaning uh, that is used in social sciences, the meaning that's used in law, the meaning that's used in geography, in uh, in uh, psychoanalysis even. And what all of those various definitions have in common is that they all have the presence of a certain actor, uh, the, their products, uh, their interests, and the asymmetry of uh, power between different actors. Uh, and uh, I think it's worth mentioning again that um, what it is corporate systemic uh, ascendancy. It is uh, the um, it accounts for the powers that corporate actors might acquire by approaching it from their ability to reorder the world in such a way as to make it as favorable as possible to their interests. Uh, so which in, in my opinion is a very interesting concept and it can be applied to a wide range of different cases. And with, as we already heard, this corporate systemic ascendancy uh, is hugely um, present in the uh, expert committees uh, in charge of standards for food additives. And what me and Deborah would like uh, to do today in our presentation is apply what we um, read in the paper to a case study and um, because as we already saw that like uh, in 1950s in the in the time when uh, uh, that is described in the paper there are already like 17 categories of food additives at that time and uh, these categories inside of them had thousands of uh, uh, additives and pesticides and uh, right now the number goes even further and how how they are controlled is still affected by what is talked about in the paper. And what we would like to do is just like contextualize it. And in order to make it more understandable, uh, we decided to look at it uh, through the example of one of the pesticides that is called uh, glyphosate. And um, I cannot account for you, but I can say for myself that uh, I cannot, uh, I don't understand the, major, uh, the majority of the ter uh, terms uh, inside of these reports because I don't have a degree in chemistry. And what I do understand, it is s certainly not sufficient. Uh, so I would like to uh, suggest to you a more, uh, like, uh, a more simplified introduction into this pesticide. Uh, what you need to know is that it's a substance used to control unwanted crops and uh, it facilitates and regulates plant, uh, plant growth. And it is the most frequently used uh, substance uh, both worldwide and in the EU. And um, it has been like this for several decades. And it's all amazing, but um, at the same time, uh, glyphosate has been reported to increase the risk of cancer, uh, several other diseases, even autism, and uh, it is nevertheless currently approved and widely used. So uh, this is a pesticide that we're going to talk about and um, we're going to talk about the standards behind all of this and how industries have, um, how we can see that uh, industries influence uh, the work of these organizations in charge of it all. And as uh, the same as in the paper, we decided to structure it in four, uh, possib um, four forms of their possible presence and action, uh, worldviews, experts in the expert committees, the machinery of expertise, uh, and the uh, uh, tools and the norms. Uh, so with regard to the worldview, um, uh, the paper, um, like in the paper, uh, it is identified that uh, in, the official public documents presented by WHO and FAO, there is um, this sort of worldview uh, in which um, 
The protection of public health uh, is interlinked with industrial and market development. So the principles on which experts and the commissions have been guided are the protection of public health, the protection of consum uh, consumers against falsification and economic needs. And uh, we can see how, apart from thinking about the consumer, uh, they're trying to create as few uh, constraints as possible for the industry. And this is exactly the result of the, uh, like of the work of uh, the industry representatives that are capable of this. And if we come back to the example of glyphosate, uh, despite the fact that WHO classified it as carcinogenic uh, in 2015, which means that it's caused diseases. Uh, it is still currently approved and it is, as I have said, a uh, largest uh, selling crop, uh, crop protection chemical in the market. And uh, the sales go only up because if we compare what we're using today and what we used when it was introduced, we're using 100 times as much because the plants are becoming uh, resistant to it as it happens with all the pesticides. So uh, another, uh, apart from worldviews, another form of possible presence um, and action of industries uh, in the uh, expert committees is the uh, experts themselves. Uh, and uh, so in, th in this report that we have found, uh, it is the report on environmental health criteria for glyphosate. Uh, we analyze the composition and properties of uh, the experts present. And we can see that some of them do have academic uh, uh, positions, but one of them particularly that was like uh, that um, was particularly evident to us. One of them is the employee of the company that is actually the largest uh, seller of glyphosate-based pesticides, so basically a representative of the industry. And of course, we cannot know if they uh, somehow influence the decision or lessen the importance of uh, public health protection, but. Um, because of some possible ban, or, but we can say, uh, we, we can see the result of it. We can see that it is still not banned, it is safe to use despite um, possible cancer uh, effects that we talked about in, uh, in the previous slide. So now my colleague Deborah is going to go more in depth uh, of it with the machinery of expertise. Uh, thank you very much. So I'll be talking about um, the third presence and action, which is the machinery of expertise. So um, this is just all about um, the formation of the committee, of the expert committee. So basically from the text, we um, saw that um, the inclusion of um, scientific experts should be based on two for the first is um, scientific and technical expertise. So what this um, basically means is that for anyone to be found suitable on the committee of expert, that the person has to be a specialist either in antioxidant or antimicrobial. Um, so the next is um, nationality. So still in the text, they said that all countries and geographical areas need to be reasonably um, represented. But then when we looked at the text, we realized like Asia, Latin America and Africa were actually underrepresented. Then um, the second thing is the working relationship of um, some of the um, scientific experts. So um, still from the text, it was pointed that many of the um, scientific experts, they had a close working relationship with the industry. And sometimes they had a direct link with the industry. So we just um, realized like this will lead to industrial involvement at various stages of the preparation and implementation of the expertise work. So like um, just to talk a bit more on this, we're just thinking like um, since um, this scientific expert on this committee, they are involved in the whole process of um, creating the new recommendation of the report. So definitely they are going to um, try to bring in the industry's um, interest into setting this recommendation. So aside um, trying to push the industrial interest, um, they could also push their own personal agendas, such as um, their research work, result, a vision of the um, role of science and the scientists in the regulation of uh, potentially harmful chemicals. So now that uh, we sort of have an idea of how um, the expert committee is formed, so we're just trying to um, see, like um, since this um, scientific expert 
they have a close working relationship with the industry, definitely there will be a conflict of interest. They will want to like um, choose in between try, either trying to protect the public interest or promote um, the industrial interest. So um, I just try to use um, the example of um, the um, carcinogenicity of food additives and contaminants. So we try to see how those um, expert um, committees, we try to see how um, they manage the issue of carcinogenicity and how they try to address when carcinogenic substances are found in some sort of food substances. So um, going back to the report, it shows that on this issue of carcinogenicity, there were several debates and they were resistant to certain proposals. For instance, allowing carcinogens by setting limit values or accepting that a limited number of carcinogenicity tests be carried out. So, and more recently, like um, the Hong Kong consumer watchdog found that um, in some biscuits, we have um, like carcinogenic substances that are there. And they found the highest in, um, that's um, the genotoxic carcinogens were found high in, um, what's it called, the Hobsen, Ritz and Jacobs crackers. So like we just have, uh, we can just have a view of heat there. So the um, Malaysian, the, I'm going to talk about the Hobsen. So it's more of a cracker that is produced by Malaysia. The um, Food safety, uh, yeah, the Ministry of Food um, Safety and Quality of, for Malaysia, they looked into um, this issue, but then it has it like, when they finished the investigation, they, they, they said that um, this food is fit for human consumption and is in compliance with the local regulation. So this is sort of a problem. You know, when um, the, um, this joint expert committee, they are very hesitant on setting a universal limit, then they leave um, the decisions of protection back to the individual. So it's for us to make a decision to reduce our intake of this food for, for our lives to be safe. So um, in trying to create this international standard, it didn't come easy, it came with some um, constraints. And um, the first one is like, like um, Natalie just already said, there were other um, organizations and institutions that were also into um, trying to look at um, international standards of foods. But then what um, this joint expert committee tried to do is like, they tried to ensure that there is a synergy between the, their works and the works of these other organizations. And also they tried to ensure that they, they maintain conflict because when issues are not um, solved, then it actually um, makes their work a bit complicated and challenging. So um, the next problem is the issue of um, inability, inaccessibility to data. So this was seen as a very big challenge. So they said that um, in instances where they try to make a review about the accepted, accepted daily intakes of drugs or some kind of foods or some kind of uh, like a pesticide residues that should be seen in some um, food content, then when they don't have um, data, so they cannot reassess it. So it becomes a problem for them to like reassess those kind of things. Then also um, they said they had to rely on um, data from other industry. I mean, it's the same thing. In trying to um, rely on data from the other industry, they realize like this at times slows down um, their working time because this other industry, they take time in producing this data. And the last thing that was also noted was like they said, okay, if the industry cannot provide these data to, um, for us, then let's rely on literatures. But then they realize like, even in the literature, they don't provide enough information for them. So they get stuck and it really uh, makes their work challenging. So um, the last one is um, the lack of financial, technical and human resource available to them. So um, this, was a, this was another challenge for them. And it actually limited um, their numbers of meetings, the durations of the meeting, and the expert scientists in attendance. So like, the sum of this is like, it more like drops down the quality of their work. So um, to conclude all we've been trying to say, so um, this is a quote um, from the paper. So we feel like um, this quote gives a good summary of the um, concept of the corporate systemic accidency, whereby, um, the big corporations, they try to influence the decisions in 
making um, international standards for these food additive contaminants. So we just felt like, okay, this is a good finishing. So then let me just read it now. So the resistance and difficulties encountered by industry in shaping regulation that are, fav that are favorable to them are probably really insurmountable insofar as they have multiple possibilities for actions at different levels from the most infra and um, technical to the most symbolic and in different regulatory professional social arenas so okay, okay. so um, uh, we get to the first question so the first question um, the WHO expert panel reclassified and glyphosate which um, was the beginning of our um, case study as probably carcinogenic so more than 40 years ago after it was brought to the market but the range of available evidence is sufficient to classify that it is definitely carcinogenic so we're just and um, going back to the example of um, the hong kong case so we're just trying to like ask this question at what point would this expert committee decide that um, they should make a change that they should catalyze um, the movement in the JCF, like they should try to rework their recommendation policies for this um, chemical substance. Uh, then the second question would be more, uh, more into like a French case. It would be, uh, uh, despite the fact that France campaigned against glyphosate and a plan to ban it in the majority of agricultural practices by the end of 2020, uh, the sale of this um, pesticide uh, has increased despite the ban and despite the fact that they uh, even uh, put like a tax on it. So uh, with the concept of corporate systemic ascendancy, uh, we, uh, we would like to ask what are the means of making this, like the use of chemical pesticides sustainable? How is it possible? And the last question. Okay. Um, so the last question, the max, uh, maximum residual limits on chemical substance, for instance, um, the pesticide, are becoming, a cru are becoming crucial in the debate on the environmental sustainability of food system. However, with the WTO giving the freedom to the state to set um, the maximum um, residual limits of pesticide, first we're asking like, does this not lead to different levels of safety and quality of food products? Then secondly, um, taking into account this differing standard, would trade still be fair? Because you know, um, part of the objective of Codex is like it's trying to remove trade barriers. So, uh, so yeah. Then especially, uh, we are just trying to, uh, especially with giving a state to the freedom to set. Oh, sorry, especially with giving uh, with WTO giving states the freedom to set those limits. So, countries from the global south. Knowing fully well that they, de um, they depend on the um, export of agricultural products and they receive this revenue to develop their countries, wouldn't they be on the losing end here? So that's the question. Thank you. And that's all what we wanted to, to cover. Yeah. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, I'm not sure if we've short one. Thank, so, uh, thank you very much for, for your great comments and your great questions. Uh, so gly glyphosate, it's a, it's a, it's a worldwide, uh, sorry, glyphosate, this is a worldwide uh, issue. And so about the last, uh, last 10 years, at least or so, uh, there have been lots of controversies uh, in many different states and uh, at a global level. And uh, the controversies are not exactly the same in uh, different parts of, uh, of the world. Uh, I, I, I had a look and I wrote a little, f uh, um, a little bit, uh, I did a little bit of research about what happened in Argentina, in Sri Lanka and in Europe. And it's quite different. It's not exactly the same how this, uh, the problem of uh, glyphosate is uh, um, uh, developed, as developed in each of the countries uh, or areas. But uh, 
as far as uh, the, the world, uh, this is the uh, international uh, ERC. EARC, International Agency for Cancer Research, which classified, the, which has classified uh, glyphosate as a probably carcinogenic. So it's a, it, it is it's an organization which uh, depends from the World Health Organization, but it's not the World Health Organization. It's um, more complicated than that. And the ERRC, e, sorry, IARC. I will uh, manage to do, to have it right. Um, as a, a unit which do the evaluations of the carcinogenicity of substances since the 60s. And it's quite, quite a reference. For instance, when a substance uh, is classified as carcinogenic at the level of the glyphosate is, it, uh, California automatically, the state of California automatically considered it as carcinogenic at the same level and it has regulatory implications. But it, the, the systematic, it's not systematic. And for instance, the, uh, the EU do, uh, does its own evaluation assessment, risk assess hazard and risk assessment in different type of committee of glyphosate. And glyphosate has become uh, an issue in the, uh, in the EU. It, was, it is very complicated and it should have been banned and it hasn't. And it wasn't a few years ago, and uh, because of the German Ministry of Agriculture mainly, <laughs> so not mainly, so it was a, a long process. It is now being reassessed by uh, the EU. And uh, the, the, what we know is that 99% of the academic scientific literature on glyphosate toxicity has not been taken into account into the regulatory uh, assessment of the substance, 99% apparently. So we do not know exactly because it's quite complicated, but it seems it like almost all of that has been peer reviewed, produced by public academic researchers has not been taken into account. Which means this is the all, uh, all that almost uh, again, almost all the uh, almost all studied provided by the industries, which as a, a public scientist, uh, scientists working in public institutions or as when every citizen cannot access because of the industrial secrets, so pr to protect industrial, secret uh, industrial, his secrecy, sorry, to, to, uh, uh, in, to protect industry, so you cannot access. It's very complicated uh, to, to access it. There are ways, but it's really very complicated. So what we know, uh, and these uh, this, uh, studies, they follow the OECD guidelines, and uh, they are these studies, uh, these guidelines, if you use them to produce academic work, research, you won't publish, because it's not the same criteria. So this is other criteria, and um, and so uh, we it's, it's it's really tricky. It seems that this uh, this methodology, the test, etc., which are uh, <coughs> con which are considered by the regulatory authority as uh, being uh, uh, good la good practice, and the practice you need to follow, they have a set, they, set, they, they can uh, pick up certain type of carcinogenicity, city, so mechanism. There are many sort of uh, many types of mechaniz biological mechanism by which you can uh, show that uh, substance uh, you can uh, substances can be carcinogenic. So there, there's this, uh, these protocols. They only pick up certain type of mechanism, not all of them. So it's like uh, it's just like this. You know, if you hear, it's okay. If you hear, just like uh, you're falling into the trap. Uh, and also, there, there are many ways of interpreting the results. The other thing is, why is it called probably carcinogenic? Is that to have, uh, to have the highest level? It's sure it's carcinogenic. You need to have epidemiological evidence. So when uh, it's very complicated, how do you pro do you get ev ev ep epidemiological evidence for a substance which is everywhere? If you take uh, waters, you will find of them. If you take blood, you, in your blood, you will find some of them. Uh, it's really everywhere. So uh, you can set apart a group of people who, uh, who would not been exposed to glyphosate. 
So, uh, uh, so it's very complicated for many these substances which are really, we call it uh, ubiquitous everywhere to, to have people which are not exposed. And it's the case for, for most of the substances which are really heavily used or and persistent in the environment. It's really, really complicated to have this e epidemiological evidence. And so if you want to have them, you can have sometimes, but it's, you need big um, uh, organizations. For instance, a few years ago, we, there, there was like, I can't remember exactly, but uh, like probably several, uh, several tens of women which have been followed during five, 50 years. With regular, uh, with regular checkup, uh, medical, uh, so medical checkup, etc. So during 50 years, and at the, after these 50 years, with this regular checkup, etc., you could prove that we, that you would have an increase uh, in uh, in the risk of getting uh, breast cancer, if breast cancers, if you were exposed to DTT uh, as a child or uh, as a teenager. But it's a 50-year study, and the, the, the concern needs to happen. And you need to follow this, per this, people, uh, this person during 50 years, and in a in sufficient number to have uh, the epidemiologic pr proof you need for regulations. And you can, ima you can imagine that the cost is huge, and you can't do it for all the type of disease, for all the type of substances. So the type of proof which is um, uh, demanded uh, by uh, the, all these uh, expert committees uh, or uh, of the regulations is too high to obtain, and this is a problem. So you need to have regulation before you have this, this type of proof or, uh, uh, and the ban, so it's quite difficult. But still, you can have a, toxicology, a different type of other proof uh, li uh, like mechanic mechanistic proof, biological mechanistic proof, toxicological proof, etc. So, but they need to be taken into account. And if you just expel them from the regulatory evaluations because they do this proof uh, does the, the way to obtain this proof or this evidence, they don't do not match the the official guidelines. Uh, you know, we, it goes like this and this. So then you can have substances which can be banned without, um, when there are, two, there are lots of conflict like glyphosate through political processes. And this is what may almost happen in the EU two or three years ago, three years ago, except that the German Ministry of uh, Agriculture, which was mandated to, to the EU to vote, uh, to just uh, uh, not vote, to, 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 to not vote uh, for or against uh, the ban, vote, vo uh, voted against uh, the ban. If he hadn't voted, it would have, uh, glyphosate would have been vo banned from, uh, from the EU, but through a political process, not through this uh, kind of uh, regulatory uh, let's say, uh, uh, a regulatory assessment, uh, the usual regulatory assessment. So, for the qu second questions, um, so <laughs> the, self u uh, the use of uh, chemical substances, uh, making the use of chemical substances uh, sustainable. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I have been working on what I call uh, uh, the go uh, governing, uh, especially with a colleague Soraya Boudia, but with our colleague as well, as well uh, it's not possible. But it's also uh, it's also a choice which was made a long time ago and which has sorry oh, sorry. It is also a choice which was made uh, a long time ago. It was, uh, so I th probably with the, the, the onset on the, uh, the, the, uh, the industrial, the first industrial revolutions, because it's, uh, it is, uh, our economy is based on chemicals. I mean, you, if you looked around you, you have chemicals everywhere. I mean, you're wearing chemicals, products from the chemical industries, you're sitting on products in the chemical industries, the building around all the material, your computer uh, is uh, full of chemicals. 
and uh, we really ca the chemical industry is the there, 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 there is a nice expression. It is the industry of the industries. So this is really one of the base with uh, the extractive industries. We all and uh, in the energy. This is really one of the base of our economy and our development as a society. I mean, all societies. And uh, so it's uh, and the. They, they, have, uh, they, they, they have toxic, uh, the, the process of producing the chemicals you need to, to build industrial goods. You to start to extract materials, you transform them. The, 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 the materials you get is, uh, are again transformed, etc. And then they, they become waste and toxic waste. And you have production of toxicity at all the chain. Here we only pick up with, in the paper the toxicity of the food additive. Which, can, which is uh, an important toxicity, but if you're trying to think uh, to have one kilo of raw material, you produce uh, hundreds of kilos of uh, toxic waste, like uh, the, the, the raw material you extract from the soil, for instance, and then you transform them, etc., etc. So uh, it's not possible. The reason that the steel, there are things, uh, or uh, if we would need, uh, would have need to have uh, another type of development, economic development, with other logics. And the other thing is, uh, so it needs to be thought of uh, probably as uh, how you can, st uh, you ca how you can, um, you ca it, it, we can really, uh, how you can do to have uh, the less impacts. And there are strong uh, inequalities between exposure. This is why I like your last questions. Uh, the people, the persons, the group who are suffering the most of, uh, the, of uh, the, toxi the toxic world we are living in and we are producing are the people who are benefiting the less, usually. If you're thinking of uh, uh, the, the mines, for instance, the work of extracting all the materials we need for a computer, for instance. If you look at the computers, you need materials where children are involved in to get the graphs for the materials you need, like cobalt, etc. You have people who are building them, and in some of the factories, uh, in the factories where you are building your computers, you have about 40, you are exposed professionally at about 40 carci high lead carcinogenic substances. And usually you don't last long. So then you're using it, and you're not exposed as a, as a user. It's, a nice, uh, it's nice and safe. But then it goes to Ghana on or other places where it's, it's, uh, it's rarely disposed safely. Uh, it's disposed in places like uh, Ghana, in Accra, etc., where uh, you have, uh, no, Akoshibe, pardon, sorry, where places where in, in awful conditions which pollute the world and the people who are doing it in very poor conditions. And then what is extracted from the West is re exported to Europe or to the US to build new, uh, to new material, etc. But, you know, and there is a strong, uh, really a strong uh, imbalance. So it's, it's, a, it's a big problem. Uh, it's a, for me, it's a really big problem. And uh, there is a question of justice into this uh, production of exposure and uh, production of benefits. And uh, we are here in a system which is profoundly unjust. I fully agree with that. And so the Global South, I don't like this expression because in the Global South, you have, uh, uh, I like it. I mean, you need to have, uh, but I, the, when you, we need, in Global South, you have China, you have Brazil, you have India, and uh, I don't know, uh, you have Malawi, and uh, I don't know, if I, you, you have countries which have very different profiles and within the countries you have also very pe populations which have ve uh, very different profiles and uh, interest etc and uh, we uh, wealth etc and in europe uh, not far uh, in europe but in france you have people who are who are in situation of what we call on free labor 
We are working in very poor condition illegally, and we are usually coming from the global south, and they are really exploited uh, and working illegally in a in situation of ex and. And these people are usually highly exposed of, to chemicals, and this is, only, this is one, of, uh, one of their problems. They have many problems. So we, we need to think of global south, but not as places. We need also to need at places, but also as group of people and populations. And uh, as far as food is concerned, this, uh, this uh, region are producing food which are exported to Europe and, and, uh, and uh, the United States, etc. And they are also importing food. There is a double, uh, double standards. And one of the things is, is that uh, as I, I, for food additive, I don't know much, but as far as pesticides or veterinary drugs are concerned, etc., we the countries like uh, in the EU companies, the China company, because now half of the pesticides which are produced in the world are produced in China, are, uh, which are exported, for instance, in Africa, in South America, or in South Asia, in Southeast Asia, are some banned and per comp uh, in Europe or in the EU. And, and these companies are, made, are making a lot of money out of this banned uh, pesticide. And often their, um, their compositions, what, uh, the, the ingredients in the pesticides, they are different from what, what is authorized in the EU or in the United States or in Japan or in Canada, and they are more toxic. So there are these double standards, which is really important. And I am about to leave to Tanzania to, to, to look a bit. I'm working with Tanzania, uh, Tanzanian uh, scientists. And uh, the situation is quite, is quite bad, I think, really, uh, with regards to pesticides, because uh, clearly the, the capacity, to, the regulatory capacity are poor. And uh, there are lots of products which are sent there, uh, which shouldn't be sent and shouldn't, uh, are not allowed in, the, uh, in other countries like in France or in, uh, in the EU or elsewhere in the US. <laughs>